uh, today's presentation. And we're going to be talking about teenagers, a very interesting topic, a lot of parents and grandparents. But also, if you are a teenager listening to this, I would like to start by welcoming you. And um, yeah, it's going to be a short, but hopefully informative um, monologue. But I always think that I'm talking to you. So hopefully it's a dialogue with your either in a teenager or with a teenager, the actual teenager. So I'm a psychologist. My name is Daria Haitoglo. I'm a director of Virginia Satir Institute in the UK, in London. And uh, I have um, also personal experience, of course, but a mainly professional experience of working with families who have teenagers. And uh, this is one of the most uh, interesting topics, uh, quite um, uh, turbulent, but also emotional. And um, when asked uh, my clients, tell me a little bit about teenagers. What do you think? Um, most of them would say negative things. So the teenagers are moody or they're sleepy or uh, they create all sorts of issues in the families. But very few people actually shared anything positive. And when I ask teenagers what they think about uh, their time in the family when they're teenagers, they also say the negative things about their parents and, and their teachers and uh, how difficult it is for them. So I wonder um, what actually it is about and why it is so difficult. How can we make this process of parenting, but also communication, family, uh, family system uh, with teenagers, how can we make this process smoother? And is this a process, is it a time of our life? It's like a bump on the road. Do we pass through this? Or is it something we can learn from the neuroscience, from uh, psychology, from uh, the research that's been done, understanding the teenage brain, and also understanding ourselves? Because part of us is always in the teenage food. We just discussed that. And it is true. We always keep a part of ourselves uh, or part of our brain. And this is a mystery, actually. We have not fully researched or we don't know fully boy, what is happening and why it is happening. That um, sometimes when we are triggered, we go back to that sort of uh, rebel stage, that emotional stage. So let me give you a little bit of um, information about the brain first. So what is happening in the teenage years, that puberty, that adolescence. And um, I always like to think of it um, as imagine a toddler when they're two or three years old. If you had a, a toddler or um, if you um, if you don't have children, that's also something educational for you to be aware of, okay? So teenagers are like giant toddlers, okay? So when toddlers go through their hormonal changes during their uh, second or third year of their life, the brain is completely rewiring, meaning that their pathways, they're uh, like a Legoland, you know, sort of like this, they shift, they put their different bricks together, the puzzles change, and the uh, physiologically sort of the, the parts grow, they transform, and the hormonal balance changes. And it's very uh, unsettling, both for the to toddler, especially boys, because their testosterone is, is um, going really, really high during those two, you know, the, uh, toddler's years. Same happens in the teenage years. So a teenage brain changes in multiple ways. First of all, the prefrontal cortex, uh, the part of the brain that's behind the lobe uh, or forehead, it's the newest part and it's the executive function, so to say. So this is the part that controls the impulses and soothes them and calms them down. So this part is not very active during... Um, uh, teenage years because it's still developing and when I say it's not active I mean it is active but it's not it's almost like it's catching up with the limbic system or the amygdala it's part of the brain in the middle of the head and it's responsible for emotion for um, understanding the triggers if it's a danger if it's not so normally uh, what we know the brain is still developing up until our 
young adults are in their mid-20s. Up until 25 years old, our prefrontal cortex and generative brain is developing. Cerebellum, another part of the brain that is responsible for creating havoc in the behavior of our teenagers, um, is also developing and they're catching up. A limbic system, and especially amygdala, it becomes the primary um, communication pathway. And a lot of the time teenagers fail to recognize the cues or the stimuli, the uh, events or interpreting events differently. So for example, for adults, when we see a face that may be scared or a neutral face, teenagers may interpret it as an angry face. And what happens when they see an angry face, they get activated and they, they start reacting to that emotionally. So they either fight emotionally or mentally, or they uh, they uh, flee, they run away, they try to hide, they try to uh, lie to protect themselves, to protect uh, their integrity, their, their developing identity, the, the ego state, or they try to freeze and sort of like um, also, you know, hide, lie, you know, disappear and uh, pretend that nothing is happening. But there's a lot of things happening in teenagers' brain. So as we know, there is a, a whole set of uh, hormonal glands. There's um, the pituitary gland. Uh, there's also hypothalamus. They get activated and um, gonadotropin uh, releasing hormones that are responsible for follicle producing, especially in men uh, and boys and teenagers, uh, follicle producing uh, testicles that produce testosterone they are on boost, okay? So testosterone is overflowing. What happens in the brain and in the body when testosterone overflows? They get aggressive. And there is an evolutionary reason for uh, teenagers to get aggressive because the main need during the teenage years is and the need for autonomy. They want to be away or different and they're preparing to separate from their family of origin to go and create their own family and that's a, a unique sort of paradox situation where we are as mammals the only type of mammal that keeps the offspring for so long together with the original family because they are their brain is not yet ready uh, as a giant toddler you know walking ahead they seem to be tall and and big or tall and uh, sort of sexy, but they're not fully developed yet. They still need those regulating functions from their parents or from their caregivers to help them make better decisions, to help them navigate through life, and to help them uh, just make basic things work. So that's a paradox that we are living with it, as all humans and from the time even Aristotle and Plato used to write in Shakespeare about adolescence that, you know, it's, it's a, such a hard time. And of course, all the parents they experience, once they experience this, they know how hard it is. So a few, a few more notes on this. As the amygdala uh, sends signals and testosterone is overflowing, for girls, there's a lot of progesterone and also estrogen. And that makes girls very moody and also creates the, this is big emotions. And uh, teenage girls and teenage boys, of course, what mainly hap is happening is the so sexual attraction and exploration of um, of the sexuality, of sensuality, of sexual identity, of um, uh, attraction, understanding of the body image. Actually, I would like to share an image of the brain of a teenager. Let me see if I can, I can do this. Uh, I love this one. Uh, if you can see, let me just make this big. So the prefrontal lobe is called the love lobe. It's all about love and uh, finding the partner. Now, of course, there's this rebellion center uh, that's connected to the ego, the personality fluctuation. There's a lot of changes. You know what we don't know about the teenage brain uh, is that how many changes it's going through and how plastic the 
the brain becomes. So we know a lot about the early years, you know, up to three years of age, how important uh, the attachment is or how important the development of the first three years. But actually what we don't know and we don't talk about is how important it is for us to create a bond, a connection, and that um, sense of uh, understanding with a teenager, with their brain. And uh, we will talk about the, and the strategies, how we can do that as parents or as grandparents, as educators, as teachers, as coaches. I mean, people who deal with teenagers, they all experience the same issues. Even teenagers themselves, you know, if you ask them, they will tell you they most of the time are aware of their own issue and they're not making it difficult. They're not trying to be the baddie. They're actually trying their best, but they're failing for understandable reasons. Look at their brain. I mean, uh, look at this yin and yang, love for parents, hate for parents. Because of these uh, over, let's say, used amygdala and under um, developed prefrontal cortex and cerebellum, the interpretation of of the signals, of the emotions of the outside world, especially the parents who are trying to help by um, giving advice or controlling or disciplining or making barriers, making some choices for the teenagers that are not comfortable. A lot of them are punitive. They're, a lot of them are painful so there's a lot of hate for parents and the 11 year old who once said you know i love you uh dad you know two three years later they will say i hate you dad because of this um of this relationship intention and because they their desire to separate to find their sexual mate and to leave basically but they cannot yet because of our societal norms a societal pressure, the whole economic and financial system, our teenagers are not yet fit to be on their own. So that's why it's a little bit of a curious time uh, from, you know, the 13 up until 23, 25, let's say 21, when, or maybe 18 when they leave, right? But these are very, very tricky years because there's a lot of um, slime and punch and reflex, you know, <laughs> and a lot, a lot of um, sort of uh, spontaneity, risk, uh, risky behavior, even going for dangerous things because of another hormone that is flooding um, the teenage brain called dopamine. Dopamine is all about risk taking. And this um, addiction to Facebook and the cell phone, it's true. Addiction now, of course, there's a TikTok and all sorts of different social media, Instagram. But what the social media give um, to the teenager is what they're craving, is this dopamine release. And that's why it's so addictive. Their cell phone, which in our generations, even you know, in my generation, we never had. But the new generations of teenagers are now sort of native. They're born with it, with a phone, with gadgets, with iPads, with um, with you know, this little uh, gimmicks that uh, they constantly use. And the e easiness and also multitasking nature, which is not even actual multitasking, but uh, multiple monotasking change. You know, when we think that a person multitasks on the phone, what they do, they actually switch uh, attention to many, many, many different things. And that's why the quality of attention decreases. The ability to sustain and uh, achieve difficult tasks and goals is uh, actually reduced. And we see now the addiction to social media much more prominent in psychology and counseling and therapy issues, uh, working with clients than you know, alcohol or drug addiction. I mean, this is a drug of choice currently, the social media and the cell phone and the gaming. Because of this dopamine release and immediate gratification syndrome. So as they receive that boost, they uh, their brain literally just attaches the meaning of, oh, positive, uh, positive, positive, 
a word, a word, pleasure, pleasure, and they go for it again and again and again. And there's, it's not a bad per, uh, thing per se, per se, but it is something that we need to be aware of and uh, have a strategy on how we want to deal with this. So we can talk about that in a, in a bit. So there's a whole thing about self-awareness and self-image that's a very, very potent and very much becomes part of, uh, of a teenage um, identity crisis because their embodied Im image of themselves is not the same as a virtual image that they portray in the social media. And what the image that they see in other peers and other uh, role models is not the actual state of that person but that's what they see and that's what they compare with themselves and they don't like themselves so the body hate the body loathing all of that is part of the teenage brain uh concept the, this whole thing that we're talking about the the changes that the body goes through this awkwardness of the body parts that are enlarged that are uh, maybe uh, different that they are not they are not used to. Some become um, quickly bigger. Some become small. Bodies are different, and from sort of a similar body type, suddenly in adolescence, uh, the humans become very very different, right? In uh, the size of the breasts, for example, or the size of shoulders, the size of feet, the size of heads, and um, what for adults is diversity for teenager um, uh, may be disaster because they want to belong they want to be accepted they want to find their tribe they want to um, to be seen and respected by their peers rather than adults and this is a time where they see themselves in the eyes of their friends the eyes of their uh, partners, uh, their their girlfriends and boyfriends. This is much more important than uh, the attitude that their parents have about them. They actually, they would do the opposite what their parents ask, just uh, for the sake of it. There's also uh, an interesting lobe called curiosity. So they're very curious cre creatures, and they're very creative. Because of the dopamine release and all this testosterone boost, even for girls, there's a lot of testosterone boost. So they are prone to take risks and change and adapt and do something completely different out of character, as we say. And that is a time of incredible exploration, which is an opportunity. It's a window for us to connect with them in a very different way. It's a window to connect with our own teenager, our own inner child who maybe never had that ability or had an ability and maybe feeling guilty and shameful or were shamed or were uh, maybe felt sad or guilty for doing certain things and now we want to prevent our children or grandchildren from doing it but it's also a time of reflection and finding a new balance and a new coordination there's a lot of memories being created because of that collaboration with amygdala amygdala is the emotion center limbic system of the brain is one of the most crucial for us to create memories so no wonder a lot of memories that we don't remember early in our childhood years, but actually we we remember a lot in teenager in teenagehood, because it's very emotional time, and experiential time, time of uh, adventures, time of falling in love, of heartbreak and stories, and our peers and friends, uh, loving or hating us, and what we do and how we are perceived what kind of communication tools we learn i mean everything matters at this stage although teenagers say oh i don't care nothing matters oh i don't want this i don't but actually everything matters to them so that's why the connectivity the bonding actually what they're longing longing for is the trust and the authority figures who they they don't have anymore because parents don't sort of disappear Dis disappear they don't uh they're not uh figures as uh, authority anymore they're not figures as role models anymore they become kind of enemies <laughs> we are going against the flow here so how do we turn this around and become 
a, a confidant, a friend, an advisor, that love low prefrontal cortex that regulating function, executive function for our teenagers. And how do we keep uh, the connection going so we don't lose our, uh, our kids? Uh, Gabor Mate wrote a brilliant book on how to hold on to your kids, because if we don't, they go and find what they hold on to somewhere else. And most of the time, it's dysfunctional and it's not healthy holding on to. Uh, what we want is go through this tough, tough period working on ourselves and working with our own emotions as parents because we are losing control we're not in control anymore and if we're going after a pavlovian sort of like praise re reward and punishment kind of model we get a lot of pushback because of the autonomy seeking uh, kind of behavior what they want is freedom but of course if you give them full freedom they do silly things so how do we strike the balance with this kind of teenager not an easy task hey and uh, there are a few tricks there are a few strategies that i can share that work uh wonders so first of all is number one okay is to chill just to relax as a parent as a grandparent as a as a person next to a teenager Teenagers are stressed. They are overly stressed during this period. So what they need is a calming agent, a calming, soothing part um, that may be external advisor in your, uh, you know, in the body of a parent who's just calm. And whenever a teenager is sort of playing up uh, their emotions or going through something, uh, what a parent can say is, um, how can I help? What can I do for you? Um, can I give you a hug? And even if there is a no as an answer, remember that what they say, and what they do, they're like giant toddlers. They may throw tantrums, but what they need is somebody to hold them tight, even emotionally or mentally, just hold them, just embrace them, give them space, but also embrace. Because when we give them that uh, emotional and mental embrace by creating space, by respecting them, by uh, feeling that calm, we are also connecting to their calming parts and hopefully uh, connecting through that mirror neurons as uh, we all have them they will get that boost of serotonin the hormone that relaxes the hormone that soothes the hormone that gives that sort of sense of loving gratification rather than just like a boost of you know whatever sugar craving or um, that danger zone craving Serotonin is a wonderful hormone, and it's uh, it, it, they will experience this later on after they're 18, for sure. But during that time, they need us to be on the calmer side. And although it's very hard when a teen teenager comes uh, home, when they forgot to tell us what time they um they're coming or their phone got switched off or they switched off or they they lied about something and we discover something that they didn't do or they didn't finish an assignment at school or whatever whatever negative the the event or the meaning of the event that we put we still need to work on our own reaction and find compassion find love find that level of calmness in ourselves that's the best thing we can do for them that's number one number two I always recommend to reiterate the values of your family or, or of your communication. So, for example, in our family, there is a value of honesty. So when, for example, we discover that our kids lie, we uh, hold a family meeting, normally the next day or the same day because it's it's very, very good to to catch, uh, you know, the while it's still hot, right? <laughs> the, the fire, because they know what's happening. So we create a family meeting and we first stay calm. 
we open the meeting with the appreciations that we appreciate whatever they do or we appreciate the whatever we appreciate always with the positive then we share the new information something that they don't know something that might happen then we share a puzzle a puzzle can be, for example, well, I don't get, you know, what happened there. I, I don't understand this, but, you know, fill me in on some of your projects, you know, what's happening with your um, school week and your school trip, etc. And then number four, we, we share the worry with recommendation. And the worry is generally... Um, a recommendation is reiterating the, the family rule, rule. So, for example, well, I worry when you share something that is not true. And our value is honesty. So we are prepared to, to face something that is very hard in this kind of meetings. Please share the truth. And rather than just cover it and lie about it. And then we finish it with the hope and wishes and hugs. And um, it's a temperature reading exercise that um, Virginia Satir created, but it works wonders. So number two, reiterate the family rules or the values, right? The values. So if the value is, for example, um, connection, right? I would like to be connected when you're late. Tell me you're late. And uh, tell me when you're going to come, because for me, being connected to you is more important than, um, you know, being on time, for example. It's okay for me to know that you're going to be late as soon as I know. Okay, so that's number two. Number three is having or establish a strategic bond experience, preventative. So normally we get activated as parents or grandparents or caregivers or teachers when we discover something negative about teenagers' behavior. But I suggest we do that proactively. In advance, we create experiences that A, boost their dopamine, so something that's exciting, something that's different, a travel or um, a game together, you know, connecting the time together, a great dinner together, or um, uh, satisfy their need and create that bond. So not just criticize or uh, punish them or only see the bad in, in that teenage period but trying to connect by understanding by by pacing them so if they are for example if they want to play a computer game sit next to them and uh, you know ask them to tell you what exactly they're doing or play with them connect with them in the environment that they are most receptive in and once that bond and that connection is established the pacing happens then lead what I mean by that is that once, for example, the teenager feels like you're on their spot in, in their uh, area of interest, like a teenager, for example, is into graffiti and you allow, that's what happened actually today, we allowed um, uh, him to, to draw, to invite his friends and to paint graffiti paint on one of the walls. And then we're going to, you know, outside and we're going to uh, paint it afterwards white. So, but it, we went for it because we know that it's something that he really values. So by doing that, we're establishing that bonding and that trust and that interest. And as though we're saying, look, we really care for you. We know that you would like to do it instead of you doing some, some sort of other uh, house that is illegal. Come, come and do it here in a safe environment. And we, we were going to provide for that experience. Okay, it's going to be a fun experience. Actually, I'm going to enjoy some of the writings or some of the uh, graffiti that you're going to create. Maybe you, you're a graffiti artist in your heart. So creating that strategically it's a very important step. And most parents, I mean, me included, it's, a, it's an afterthought. It's very hard to do. But when we become aware, conscious, and we plan for it, we actually start noticing, okay, how much time do I spend? How much time do I want to spend with my uh, teenager? Maybe I can go in, to a concert or to a movie or cinema or to a nice place. Maybe I create an experience for him and, and his friends. What can I do to connect and find out what he's into or she's into? And how can I facilitate the process of connection so that we establish that bucket, the container of positive 
bonding because it is my investment. The larger the bonding container, the more I can get from it afterwards when, as I say, shit hits the fan, when his nervous system is under threat and when you know he's reacting, that's when I will need to draw from that container of trust. If I only draw from a container of negativity and criticism, there is no trust established. So they, the relationship is not there and it will be toxic and taxing uh, on both sides. It, it will be a toxic relationship of power struggle, pull and push, and it's going to be a painful period of relationship connection. So instead of uh, drawing, withdrawing, overdrafting from the negative, I suggest to fill the positive bucket proactively by doing this uh, uh, steps towards them by and you're an adult, you're, so you're connected. Uh, and it's your responsibility. Teenagers rarely make a step. They actually take step to stay steps back because they are afraid. They don't know what they're capable, able of. They're actually scared of their own reactions and for good reasons, because there are some uh, strong reactions uh, um, uh, on the inside. Every, it's like a transform transformer, you know? It's like sort of this metamorphosis happening on the inside. It's like a butterfly creating from the you know, cocoon. It's a very painful experience. So the parents uh, are responsible to take that step towards the teenager and create a bond and create a bridge towards them so literally, these are the steps I recommend. So first, be calm. Second, reiterate the values. And third, create strategically bonding experiences that would increase this uh, connection, understanding. And of course, educate yourself. There are so many podcasts. There are so many articles. There's so many books written on the teenage brain, on uh, the parenting of teenagers, on understanding the um, sort of holistically of what we're going through as families. And we're not alone. Every family pretty much goes through this. So connecting and educating uh, instead of just sort of putting the blame on the teenagers, having a bit of compassion, doing some self inner work, creating moments of uh, calmness, loving, bonding, hugging, and boosting that validation, that appreciation, and remembering they're struggling. They are really struggling, struggling themselves. So having that spot in your heart for, um, for compassion is very important. So this is my little thought and also a bit of explanation about the brain. Um, there's always art and science in parenting and uh, educating teenagers. And I believe the best teachers who deal with teenagers the best are those who have done their inner work with their inner teenager. Because teenagers are inner teenagers, the parts of us that are teenagers. These are rebels. These are parts that are younger. They are not fully healed. They're fully developed. They are the ones that get triggered the most because of this um, amygdala hijack, you know, amygdala hijacking is that when we interpret the faces or uh, reactions of people or circumstances, very emotionally over-exaggerating most of the time. And the reality may be completely different, but it takes a little bit of time and a bit of help of others who are more emotionally regulated to soothe that part. So the better we are with our own teenagers, the better we will be with our actual teenagers. So inner teenagers, actual teenagers, our children versus our inner children inside us, the parts of us that we always carry. And as we look into our own parts and our own experience and remember in those uh, difficult moments, but also highlights, what were the great parts when we were teenagers? What were the experiences that you cherish, that your memories go to? Huh? Uh, what are the parts that your actual teenagers triggering you? Why? What happened? A lot of the time, these are painful experiences. So having some therapy, having some counseling done, um, 
is one of the best things we can do, not to pass on the baton, not to pass on that pattern, that trauma onto future generations. And it's never too late to work with our inner teenager. Never too late. People in their 90s, they can still work on their inner teenagers and they can help unlock some of those belief systems, uh, keys to different meaning-making, different reality-checking, different uh, word-using, different emotion um, regulation, different mental con constructs. Everything is possible, okay? So where the focus goes, energy flows. If we start focusing on the strategically working with our teenager, in a teenager, we're going to help ourselves, help our uh, young people and also in a way um, we can be a role model for them so if we soothe our own parts they soothe theirs so start with that okay that's it